I'm the Grub Street Lodger and I'm actually going back to work tomorrow. Seems a bit crazy seeing as there are more people dying now than there were when we started locking ourselves in our houses, but there you go. Uh, on with the books. When you found me last month, I'd been mostly reading Leon Garfield, and that is how I carried on. So, book one. The Confidence Man by Leon Garfield. This feels like forever ago now that I read this. This is actually one of his best. It has this really good beginning. I'm even going to read a bit. A fine April morning, even though it was Monday. Somewhere or other, the sun was shining and the birds were singing their heads off. But not in this particular street. It was dark and narrow, with winds, with bends as sharp as a pauper's elbow. It was old, shabby and broken down and even the air seemed tired of being breathed and just loafed about, thinking of cabbage and last week's pickled herrings. So yeah, it's it's one of his most committed ones in terms of style. It's a bit different. Yes, we have a young man. Yes, it's the 18th century. Um, but what happens this time is he's in Germany, he's a Protestant, he's being... Um, his family are oppressed. There's actually this this soldier who fancies his sister, and when he comes to to uh, force the issue in the middle of a storm, he gets accidentally decapitated, and this leads to this whole uh, event where the entire street goes off to America via England, and they are led by Baron von Strumpelpeter or Strumpel Strumpelpeter. And he is the confidence man. Uh, and this can be read in really many, many different ways. Because one of the questions is, is he a con man? But also he's a man that gives people confidence. But also, as we find out towards the end, he is someone who has acted better than he intended because he's being given confidence. And it's all very um, mished and, and blurred, blurred in, in how that is. It's very good. Also, uh, it's one of the more religious of the Leon Garfield books. The main character is an atheist. He then becomes more Christian as it goes on, as he's in trouble. And then he puts most of his, his, his confidence in Baron von Strahlpeter. And then at the end, he says, oh, well, I will believe in God if you part this water. And then this canoe comes past and the oars part the water and yeah it, it was interesting you don't often get religious topics uh, handled by Leon Garfield well I was going to say that there's actually two religious books coming up by Leon Garfield but we'll get to those in a bit first is The Saracen Made by Leon Garfield as you can see it's one of the um, yeah, it's a kiddie book and it tells the story of a man who goes off to do some trading for his family and he gets captured by Barbary pirates and he is freed by this Saracen maiden who only knows his name and the city and then using that she finds him at the end and apparently this was a legend that was attributed to Thomas Beckett's dad and, and his mum was supposed to be this Saracen maid which historically is complete nonsense but this was a legend that somehow got landed on them and it's retold quite nicely and it's very pleasant and there's not much else to say about it really. So I won't. I'll go on to... Let me go on to these two at the same time. That's like ears. So I've got The King in the Garden and King Nimrod's Tower and they are both, as you can see, thin, kitty, kitty kind of books uh, and based on Old Testament stories. Um, which was the first one that came out, this one I think, and this is all about the Tower of Babel, but the twist is that the Tower of Babel is happening in the background, it's all about this kid trying to sort out this dog, and the dog won't listen to him, and uh, the kid chases the dog about uh, while they're building the Tower of Babel, and then God's watching, and he's more interested in the kid and the dog than the whole building a big tower to reach heaven thing. And when he sort of curses them with different languages, he also makes it so that the dog and the boy can communicate. Because uh, it says at the very end, 
because my kingdom of heaven is better reached, said God, by a bridge than by a tower. And so that's sort of theme. So it kind of Christianizes it using my kingdom of heaven um, and gives it a slightly different flavor. It's not a vengeful God saying, ha ha, you're not going to be as big as me because I am. It's um, about different ways of trying to communicate, one by trying to over impress and the other by trying to love. And love is the answer. And then similarly, actually, they're both about Babylonian kings as well. This is Nebuchadnezzar. And he had um, dreams and nightmares that were translated by uh, Daniel. And it was also written on the wall. Was it Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parsnips or something? Anyway, so this girl here, Abigail, she finds uh, a horrible, disgusting, homeless, trampy man in her garden. Uh, at the same time, we keep cutting back to the palace of Nebuchadnezzar, where everything's running as normal. And they all think, well, Nebuchadnezzar must be there. In fact, he's been away for seven years, being mad and eating grass. And she finds him and sort of restores him to himself. And then he goes off uh, and he goes back to his kingdom as the king. And again, there's a slight twist on this. Uh, it's not just that he's being cursed by God. It's that he's learning that he isn't as important as he thought he was. Because the kingdom's gone fine and not even noticed he's gone. So there you go. And I found those two quite interesting in that um, the, uh, most of the other Leon Garfield books haven't been overtly Christian. They've been sort of mildly spiritual. Uh, judging by his pacifism and some of the other hints and things, I'd say it's probably sound like a Quaker or something, but I don't know, to be honest. Uh, there's not a lot you can read about Leon Garfield as far as I've seen. Right. Next book, again by Leon Garfield, The Restless Ghost. This was three short stories. The first one was the very first introduction of Bostock and Harris, if you read my reviews of earlier Leon Garfield books from last year, year before. Uh, he wrote two novels about Bostock and Harris, but before that he wrote a short story, and it's in here. It's called The Restless Ghost. So there's the ghost story. There's a story about uh, a painter, Dutch painter, who is disgusting, but he's so good at his art that his disgustingness doesn't really count because his humanity is all in his art and not in his person and then the last one which was my favorite one which was all about people being transported to america and shenanigans and the main thing i got to say about this was as i was reading it i'm sure i've read it before i looked at all my little records because i write down everything i read and have done for about 10 years i couldn't find anything suggest I've read this before but I know I had because I remember details and things so who knows that was my main thought I couldn't concentrate on whether how much I enjoyed the book or anything because I just kept thinking I've read that before okay next thing is the last of the Leon Garfields in fact I've only got two more to find and I've read I think everything by him um, so yeah and this is a book for adults called the House of Cards, and it came out just after his version of Edwin Drood, and it is a sort of Dickensian novel, and it's really good. And again, the whole first chapter is is really really gripping. It starts off with its baby, and you get the baby's interior monologue, and the baby is very imperious because it's a baby. It's like, "Where's my food? Hey, you, get me my food." Uh, the "Hey, you" is his mum, who is laying dead, as is everybody else in the town. The town has been massacred. And then this tramp comes along and he's rooting through the bodies and he's picking things he might need and things he might sell. And he's apologising to the corpses as he's doing it. And then he hears the baby. He goes over to the baby and he thinks, maybe I should kill the baby or leave the baby. or He can't because he, he, he's, not, he's not a horrible person. So he takes the baby. And then we cut to uh, 12 years later. And there's a girl and her dad, who isn't really her dad. It's obvious he, he used the tramp, though the girl doesn't realise this. And what I really liked was how unpleasant the girl was. Like This imperious baby had actually grown up into an imperious 13-year-old um, girl. She'd been terribly spoiled by the tramp and by everyone around her. And she causes lots of problems in this book just because she's so... Um, 
she just expects everything to be how she wants and she's very um she doesn't like people who deserve to be liked and she's not very nice at all but all these people are wrapped around her little finger though she's not the baddie in the book she's just she's just a spoiled kid um so it's about these two he has a bigger backstory uh, before he was the tramp and that all comes out um and it's all tied up to that one moment in the village so there's other characters uh, who were there who creep into this new London plot and it reminded me a bit of Bleak House there's a lot of twists and turns there's a character of a policeman there's another character of the, the lawyer they're all a bit nicer than in Bleak House and Garfield he's not quite Dickens it has to be said but he he's a pretty good almost Dickens he he manages to do that thing where what Dickens does where you go oh wow I'd never have put it like that and he does it many many times throughout all of his works but throughout this as well uh, and that is really gripping but with Dickens you feel he can't help doing it he's just this this ebullient explosion of a person and he can't help uh, explaining everything in these exciting interesting ways whereas Leon Garfield feels sometimes like he's stretching it a bit and he's trying to get to that point. So it's it's never quite as natural. Though it is really, really good. I'm not saying it isn't you. This is a very good book. Um, and, and similarly, whereas you know, Bleak House is a huge book, but it, it feels like it's actually really tightly packed in. It's about to burst out at any moment. This is stretched out even though it's not that big um so he he gets a lot of the style right and he you love the characters and hate the characters very similar to a dickens book but it just doesn't have that excess of life uh, quite so much however still very very recommended if you ever see a copy of the house of cards by leon garfield and that's the end of leon garfield now with the dr johnson uh reading circle been reading uh, one of the plays from this collection. It's called The Clandestine Marriage, and this is another weird deja vu because I thought oh, I, I, I recognise this, and it turns out that when I was um, well, about ten years ago now, I had a TV with a video player, so I used to pick up videos for ten p from uh, a video rental place. Once videos have been out of fashion for you know, a very long time, anyway. And one of the videos I got was Clandestine Marriage, though it didn't use a lot of the script. Um, we've been acting it. I've been Lord Ogilby, who is one of the more fun characters. The storyline is essentially there's this, this man called Sterling. He is rich, but he has no class. He has two daughters, an elder one who's a bit bossy, and a younger one who is all sweet and lovely. And everyone wants the younger one, who happens to be called Fanny. So everybody wants Fanny, but... Fanny is secretly married to their clerk or steward who's called Lovewell. And it's all the ins and outs of all these different characters um, trying to get this to happen. Uh, we, as a group, haven't quite got to the big climax yet. We're doing that on Tuesday. It's not as funny as, say, I mean, in this book, you've got She Stoops to Conquer, which is just very funny. Like, there aren't as many good lines. I feel that a lot of it is about imitation of speech like there's these lawyers talking and you get the feeling that if you've been alive at the time you'd have laughed quite a lot at, yeah that is how lawyers talk but because they don't talk like that anymore the joke doesn't quite go right and also all these people sort of wheeling and dealing to get hold of this girl called fanny they all come across as not very pleasant because she's never they never actually talk to her about it and if they do they don't listen to her but hey might get a, a, a new opinion of that when uh, it all blows up on Tuesday we shall see oh, I probably won't talk about it here but I'll see it'll be nice and the last book I read this took me a long time um, The Last Man by Mary Shelley and she wrote this eight years after Frankenstein, it says. And it's, uh, well, on the back, it says it's all about a big plague that comes and wipes everyone out, out in the 21st century, which is one of the reasons I wrote, uh, read it. 
plague wiping everyone out 21st century let's uh, let's read ahead shall we but most of the book actually um it is not it's really old fashioned that's that's the thing so she set it in the 21st century and and she's put a few little nods there are some flying sort of balloons that people take and and steamboats and things uh, and and the politics in England has changed. It's not a king anymore, though. Um, there's a sort of oligarchy, and uh, they vote for a Lord Protector. Uh, but half the book, and I mean literally half the book, it's you know, 400 pages and 200 pages of it, is is a sort of a a romance, and a very old-fashioned romance for the time. Uh, where, where's the date that this book came out? 1820s? No, later than that. Oh, 1826. Okay, 1826. Um, but it sort of almost harkens back to the stuff I've been reading from the late 17th century, uh, the very, very early 18th century, sort of the Euro Eliza Haywood romances and things. Uh, and it's almost like a, an Oriental tale or a Persian tale at the beginning. You know, these these um, lovers who are it's, it's it's sort of a love story about these uh, brother and sister and another brother and sister and then there's another man and a few other people getting away and it's all about them and how they sneak around the the parents and things like this and it's not terrible it's just it is really really old fashioned it's it, I mean for the time for the 1820s it's old fashioned and then the plague stump. Uh, comes and and then it's very very different and then you think oh actually she's been quite clever here the first half is all setting up this almost arcadian blissful they spend a lot of time in Windsor Forest uh, in the trees loving each other in a very peaceful way and then this plague comes and the world falls apart and it's how everyone reacts to the world falling well it's not how everyone reacts because one of the main characters actually dies before the plague comes but Yes, and then the main character is left as the last man. And all that stuff, the plague stuff's the better stuff. Um, she's really good at capturing it. Like, watching when the plague begins in the story, and the people in England are going, oh, that's far away, we don't even know where that is. Oh, that's getting closer. Oh, we probably better think about it. Uh, and then... it. Yeah, it's almost exactly the way uh, this COVID thing happened. It got closer and closer, and um, things weren't put in place in time. Though this plague in the, in the book is, is unstoppable. There's no, you catch it, you die. Um, and and most people end up catching it. So it's, it's really is the end of the world. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. The way it's told is not so interesting. Like, it's very dense. She'll pile on eight similes to say the same thing. And you think, well, I got that in the first one. You kind of, you didn't need to say it another seven times in very slightly different ways. Uh, and the characters are very stiff in how they speak. And and I'm not saying this is in, oh, it's an old book. It's stiff. I've read lots of old books and they're not all stiff. This is stiff. And uh, it's things like, th this this woman's talking to a plant because she's upset. And she calls it, oh, um, inordinate vernal green of leafiness and things. It's not, yeah, it's not smooth at any time. Um, in early youth, the living drama acted around me, drew me heart and soul into its vortex. Oh, that's all right, actually. But, yeah, I, I should have prepared some sections to show you, but I didn't. Oh, actually, I might have done. Hang on this uh, little thing here ba, 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 ba. oh I've just written lots of page numbers yeah I do some really rubbish notes sometimes you know um, and then she's not consistent with herself either and lots of odd little things like it talks about the Pacific and there's boats on it and talks about the vexed Pacific. Now I know the Pacific's the name of the ocean, but it also means peaceful. So you can't really talk about the vexed Pacific. It just sounds awkward. And then she'll contradict herself with 
this kid is three at one point, and then a bit later on he's three. But it's about three years after he was three before. He just keeps being three. And she talks about people dying often by them falling asleep. It's sort of poetic. So when two characters fell asleep, I thought they died. But they hadn't. They had actually just fallen asleep. So it's it's a book that's more interesting in its ideas than its execution, I found. Um, yeah, Mary Shelley. And that was the month. And who knows what next month's going to be. I don't know how hard I'm going to have to work. I don't know how much I'm going to read. Um, who knows? See you then, I guess. Bye-bye.